Your session is secure because math and your speaker is Alex. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, this is all right. This is working. Awesome. So thank you very much for being here. This is quite a turnout, to be honest. Um, uh, by the way, if any of you guys are from the internet and you like to do the Twitters, there's actually a hashtag for the talk because I want to make sure I laugh of all the jokes that you make out of my expense while I'm doing this. So please try to tag me or try to tag the talk or something like that. I just want to make sure I get to laugh of you guys as well. Uh, anyway, so let's get started. My name is Alex, right? I am a self-appointed data scientist at MLSEC Project. Been doing this machine learning thing for a while. Not too much, but enough to, I don't know, maybe get accepted here. I had no idea what they're doing. Um, so machine learning researcher and trainer. I just want to let you guys know that um, Machine learning training is nothing like Pokemon training. It was very different. It was not what they promised me at all. But I try to do uh, apply this machine learning stuff in network security and instant response. I was severely tortured as for, by sims. I do not want to touch one again in my life. I want to make sure that everything is done automatically for me, and that's pretty much my life goal for now. Um, and for, if for some reason you want to do some sort of APT attribution on me, my hacker spirit animal is caffeinated capybara. Capybara is the animal, official animal for the south and southeast of Brazil. Okay? So let's get started. Uh, I want to make sure that we cover some ground here. There's a lot to talk. I think we're going to be good for time. Uh, but uh, I, first of all, I want to talk about the security singularity that is approaching, given all the machine learning stuff that's being launched on the following weeks. So we must be prepared for that. And, um, but also, I want to get some history going on and to give you guys some perspective on uh, exactly what has been done so far and what potentially is being done now. Of course, I don't have all the answers. Uh, a lot of this is my opinion and my research based on, on the stuff that I have done. So I'm, I'm happy to have any vendors come here and punch me in the face or anything if I say something that's very wrong. That's that where I'm actually encouraging you to. Um, but I want to make sure you guys get the idea of what the marketing looks like and what does the actual technical stuff around this looks like so that uh, I, we might go as far as put together some sort of buyer guide so if someone is approaching you talking about machine learning, what questions should you ask them to make sure that they're actually doing some sort of machine learning? But anyway, uh, I also want to thank you all for taking the time. I mean, you guys are all on vacation, right? I mean, we don't have to do anything anymore because of the amount of machine learning that we already have. I'm pretty sure that if a network security is solved. And uh, funnily enough, I think some of you saw this, uh, this actual uh, I don't know if it was an advertisement. I don't know if it was on the website. Uh, this specific company doesn't do anything about machine learning. So I don't know. Maybe the machine learning is in the wrong track. There's other ways to solve network security. But anyway, thanks a lot for taking some time out on your vacation. Uh, a side note that I wanted to give just before I continue this is that if you actually search for network security solved on Google, the first hit is Jack Daniel. Talk about branding, man. I'll tell you, someday I'm going to be the first hit on Google for that. But anyway, let's get back to the talk. Uh, the point is, there's a lot of confusion, right? And uh, these are some questions that I've heard uh, as I started uh, telling people that I was doing this talk. Uh, they were, OK, but what about this? What about that? Is this a part of that? Is that a part of this? How does big data go into all of this and all those <laughs> questions that we, we face from time to time? Uh, around this, and uh, it makes it really challenging because the, the actual wording and the actual way that those things are presented to the general public, uh, it almost seems like uh, people are trying to deliberately confuse you. I mean, God forbid. Um, also, if someone uh, wants like cool machine learning and big data pictures, uh, there's this evil thing here, I, don't, I have no idea, from bigdatapics.tumblr. Got a bunch of them, got like a digital wave, you guys can, can have so much fun. But I guess, are we even trying to communicate? I mean, what the hell is a hyperdimensional security analytic, right? What is the third generation artificial intelligence? Is that like the third level of the matrix, right? Is that where we are right now? I mean, and the this, this security because math was actually used somewhere. I either dreamt it, 
or I actually read it somewhere. I don't remember anymore who was responsible for it. But uh, I guess the, the point is that, okay, I guess marketing people are gonna market, but uh, it, the problem is the way that those things are presented, it clearly hurts the, the capability of, the, the, of buyers and even of investors right, to differentiate amongst the offerings. We have no idea what these people are doing. We only know that it's mathy and it's advanced, right? And uh, I'm guilty of that sometimes as well, right? Especially when I don't want to really explain what I'm doing. Uh, but uh, I don't know, I, I, maybe I can do that because I'm like, not a huge company with a huge marketing team, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is, uh, I think it's important that people, uh, the, the population in general that's actually going to be consuming this, and uh, this is not like a fad, you know, and uh, just like big data is not a fad. Uh, this, this, this kind of uh, tool, this kind of thing is going to be uh, progressively more prevalent in the tools that we have to use. So we kind of have to be, to be prepared. And uh, it was actually brought to my attention that it could be a communication issue in the sense that the, the actual technical people, they talk about the, the, what their technical things are doing, but then the marketing people are kind of unable to translate that. No, 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 that's too complicated. Let's just use advanced or something like that. And that's fine, right? Uh, we just, I just wanna make sure that uh, whomever is actually doing the work, you guys can get the chance to get to the technical guys and ask the questions that uh, we, we really need. But before we get to that, let's do some, play a game. Um, so here are three uh, marketing, I'd say, lines of three different products uh, who are, uh, I don't know, doing mathy stuff. Uh, can you guys guess what year those things are from? I'll give you a hint. They're, they're not from the same year. Each one is, is a different year. Anyone want to try, I don't know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago? What you guys want to... Yes, there is one from 19... Uh, there's, actually, there's one from 95, right? The bottom one, which maintains historical profiles of usage per user, is from 95. Right, it was one of the, I'll get to that, but it was one of the first IDSs that was, uh, came out of, uh, of academia, right? The first one, and I was hoping there would be some hardcore ISS guys here. It's actually from the Provenci Anomaly Detection. You guys remember that? That was like 10 years ago. And uh, the middle one is recent. It's, it's from this year. I'm not gonna tell the company because I don't really have to, but uh, I mean, it's hard to tell them apart. It's, uh, have, we actually, have we actually been doing the same thing over and over again? Well, I'm not sure, right? But there's this lady, Dorothy Denning. Uh, she was responsible for the first research uh, that came out, uh, what would become the first IDS, right? It was 86. And when she wrote the paper, she already had it there that, okay, this thing to actually work has to have a, a kind of a rule-based engine, right? like a signature kind of thing. I'm not quite sure what that is, but you gotta like tell, okay, this is bad, so get that. And, but also had to have some sort of statistical package, some sort of anomaly detection built in that would be able to find unknown unknowns or anything. I don't think they used that word that back then, but uh, try to find uh, some sort of AP talk. That they didn't, definitely didn't do it. Uh, what's funny is that uh, a few years later, her colleagues, I guess all men, decided to release the next generation IDES, right? You guys think you're fancy because you, all your stuff is next generation. Man, it's so 93, I'm sorry. And, um, but anyway, things changed when a three-letter acronym uh, actually made a big fuss in the security industry. And it's definitely not the three-letter acronym that you think it is. Actually, some guys called the KDD. Um, what actually happened is, after Bro and Snort came out, uh, DARPA pretty much figured out, you know what, I think we got the signature thing covered, let's do something else, and boy, were they right. This is exactly what we use today, but anyway. Uh, I'm not implying that they're bad, they, they do their job very well. But, uh, so DARPA released some data sets for user anomaly detection in 98 and 99, right? And it's, man, God, it's the crazy stuff. It's like some TCP dumps and Solaris audit logs. It's like, <laughs> okay. And uh, we have the, the KDD 99 data set, which is, 
I'd say by rights the most famous one that's actually used for uh, some sort of machine learning or anomaly detection and security. It has over six, okay, it's there, six, uh, 6,300 citations on Google Scholar. And that's awesome because uh, the fact is that in 99, if you guys do uh, actually look it up, look at the, the number of papers on the subject, there was a boom. People started publishing a lot using this data set. And they really started digging in what could, be, could we potentially find uh, having a, a minimum amount of information, what we could potentially dig around, right? And maybe, maybe we could take a little bit of the burden uh, of us as network engineers or security people or whatever we were called back then. Um, what bothers me is that in 2014, there's still like 300 citations. I mean, these people are using a 15-year-old data set to argue that their machine learning technique is better, is half a percent better than the one that came out last year. And I don't know, I mean, there's a modified mutual information feature. I have no idea what that is. But why are you doing it on KDD 99? I'm pretty sure there are other data sets out there. Maybe. I mean, of course, there are, some, there are some things about publications, and I'll get to that, but uh, uh, this should offend you, right? In the same sense that if you were a med student and you were trying to learn anatomy, all that you had to guide yourself was this Rembrandt painting. And then you're like, hey, professor, why don't we cut up another guy? No, 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 you can't do that. The IRB will not let you. There's some privacy issues going on. And uh, I, I mean, of course the human body hasn't changed that much, although I don't think we have a good clear view here. Uh, but uh, I think in 15 years we kind of have evolved and, and things have changed and we should be trying to bring uh, uh, academia in a way in, in this public research to a higher level uh, with different data sets and things of the like. Uh, uh, there's an interesting side here, is that uh, back in 2000, uh, there was this guy, John McHugh from Carnegie Mellon, who actually published a paper saying that the DARPA data set sucked, and that they were not fit for purpose at all. And I, I couldn't find one about the KDD-99, but maybe I didn't look too hard. Uh, but uh, actually, it's, it's, it's an interesting paper. It's more of a rant about uh, how people are not creating reproducible research. And uh, frankly, that could have been written yesterday. But uh, it's interesting because, yeah, people are misusing this. They're not publishing their methods. They're not doing this properly. They're just like, it's almost like a race to the bottom, actually to the top, where, okay, I got a, like one percentage, dot one percentage point better uh, false positive prevention than you. And uh, I don't know, I don't know why there's, I, I honestly don't know why there are so many papers. I was never a grad student. I never uh, uh, studied this in university. And uh, maybe, maybe it's like a prank. Maybe it's like, if you do this, <laughs> you, okay, if you start researching this, you actually have to write a paper on KDD 99, right? That's like, that's the kind of the, of the, of the thing that you have to do. And, uh, but anyway, I'm not trying to bash here, right? And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work, but I just want you guys to get, get around the, 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 the mind frame, right, of what usually happens. Uh, when you're trying to do research on machine learning and things like that, when you have a very, very closed environment, when you're not trying to reach out and trying to understand what's actually there, right? I would never mess with academia. They are very scary, right? I mean, there was recently this math lab bust. <laughs> I don't want to mess with these guys at all. But anyway, think about this, right? You're a grad student, right? You're like, you're brilliant, you're doing a great job, your professors love you, and you've got this kick-ass uh, kick result on KDD 99, and you know what? I'm gonna start a startup, right? I'm gonna get a business guy, and we're gonna start like building some shit. We're gonna like sell a lot of stuff, right? So I'd like to borrow the, the Gartner hype cycle here just to try to illustrate what I believe is a probable outcome of that, right? Uh, pretty much we start, hey, guys just started out, he has no idea what's going on, he's like, okay, where's the party? Uh, but then you know, he starts studying, he starts learning, and he comes across KDD 99, and then, oh my God, result, the results are amazing. Like, I'm like 95% uh, catch rate. It's like, it's fantastic. Let's, let's put some money, let's get some mad VC money, let's do a bunch of stuff, right? And then they actually reach 
uh, what would be maybe a production level data set, someone that they, something that they actually gather from uh, a potential customer or something like that. And then you see that the inflection changes a little bit, right? Where are those results, right? What, where, where is this thing that I'm looking for, right? And uh, it, this is really where the, the road forks, right? It really depends on how able and how uh, capable the business guys are. Because, I mean, you could just, okay, math, just stop. And that has two, has two ways of looking at that. It's either the guy telling math to stop, or maybe the business guy is, okay, let's stop with this math stuff, because we can probably make money some, somewhere else, right? And uh, we finally end up with, Math is hard, let's go shopping. But actually, when I say shopping, I mean selling, right? So let's say, for instance, you've done a bunch of uh, publicity around um, models that you build for specific purposes and that you are solving security, and then suddenly you transition your company to sell consultancy and uh, instant response. There's shit load, loads of money on that. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And uh, I mean, honestly, uh, it's, it's, it happens. Right? Maybe you didn't get the results that you wanted, maybe, and then you're just like, yeah, let's, let's sell normal stuff. And I completely understand that. I call these guys the has-beens, which is unfair, because they're like swimming in cash, like, and I had to think this morning if I was going to pay for the bottle of water in my room. Right? So, but the point is, hey guys, you already got yours. Leave some of the machine learning stuff for us. Like, there's some guys who are actually trying to do something. And, uh, there's another interesting pattern which I call the machine, the machine learning shrug, which is, hey, this sounds cool, let's put it on our brochure. I have absolutely nothing to do with machine learning at all, and you can really, like, I deliver lemons by uh, bicycle using machine learning, uh, something like that. You can usually identify by, by patterns like this, and uh, they just add it to the brochure, right? And uh, those two guys, they should be relatively easy for you to differentiate. Um, I'm really focused on the sweet spot. The people who are actually trying to do something, they're actually trying to build anomaly detection engines, they're try, actually trying to build classification engines, right? And I wanna I want talk a little bit about the technology um, so that you guys understand. At least I can share with you what are the challenges that I see, right? And if these guys are really committed on doing a good job, um, this is some, probably some of the stuff that they should be thinking of as well. Right? And this is definitely the stuff that you should be thinking of as, as well as you are shopping for uh, potentially uh, getting a tool like this to your environment. Anyway, let's start off with anomaly detection, right? Uh, anomaly detection is interesting uh, in the sense that um, you're trying, it's mainly uh, what we call an, an unsupervised uh, machine learning problem. I'm not going to go, I mean, I already did a talk with like, yeah, this is this, I'm not gonna, go to, I'm not gonna waste too much time on that. But uh, mainly, uh, I guess what, what's important here is that when you're doing anomaly detection, you absolutely have no idea what's going on. So you cannot describe in any meaningful way uh, what uh, you're looking for. You're just trying to look stuff that it's weird. And weird in relation to something that's Normal. So you, you, you see the pauses, the dramatic pauses are are, are intentional, and um, but anyway, this is not that bad. This works great, right? When you have an industrial-like process, right? When you know that your screw has to be like this tall, right? Has to be this wide, right? And you have this production line, and you want to make sure that you do not uh, you do not have uh, defective pieces. Right? That, that diverge too much from what you would be expected. That's what anomaly detection is for, right? You know, ex you, know, you, know you, you have a very good grasp of what normal is. Since you have no idea what weird is, you, you might as well have a very good grasp on what normal is, right? And, uh, and this whole, uh, you probably have heard of the Six Sigma kind of thing. It's exactly that. People are talking about, I'm trying to see something. I'm trying to make sure that there's no significant deviation uh, until uh, in, in a range of uh, six standard deviations of the normal or the mean or, or what we'll be looking for. And this is also has historically been used in, in, in fraud prevention because, come on, your balance is a number, right? The money comes in, money comes out. The only operation you have is 
spend money. You can spend negative money if you're depositing or something like that. So in the beginning, people were trying to were playing around with that and, and help. And still to this day, if you like, if you want to spend like ten thousand dollars on on the on casino ships here, your your credit card company will call you. I, I mean, maybe not all of you. There's probably some. But anyway, but you know, you guys get you guys get what I mean, right? It it actually works, right? And uh, it it's not just for. I'm not talking just about industrial stuff, right? If you are a DevOpsy kind of guy. Right? If you are running an industrial-like internet process, right, when all your machines have to have a certain behavior, all your machines have to be to to work in a certain way, uh, these kinds of techniques, these kinds of behaviors, uh, are important for you to actually make a move to actually. Okay, this is you see, there's red dots there. It's magically figuring out based on on on, on past performance that those red dots are weird, and that potentially someone should do something with it. Uh, the problem that I find is uh, um, that, of course, there are, there are several problems, right? Uh, there's actually three problems that I, I want to talk about, and um, it, it makes it challenging when we're talking. Some of these are not security specific, right? But uh, there are some of them who make it specifically hard for security, uh, in my opinion. So. Anyway, in this mode, I'm generally speaking about uh, network behavior analysis or net flow behavior analysis and user behavior analysis. Uh, I'll be mostly be focused on, on network, and then we'll have a quick uh, sum up about user. Um, first of all, I want to talk about what is called the curse of dimensionality, which is a very ominous name for something that's actually very interesting. Um, the point is, if you're measuring anomalies in something, you have to have a way to represent uh, those events or something in, in some sort of space. There has to be some sort of dimension, some sort of something that you're doing, right? And uh, you need to have a distance. So let's say that all your normal stuff happened here in this 3D space. How can I measure if this is an anomaly, right? So I can maybe try to put like a, a, an Euclidean distance here, so it's pretty much a straight line there. I can try to put, sorry? It's, okay, it's just, it was just feedback, I'm sorry. And or you can try to do a Manhattan distance, and uh, which pretty much is you just walk like in Manhattan, like through the blocks. That's that's a terrible name, but anyway, it's not my not my point. Um, what happens in in high dimensional data? And I will not go through the math. Actually, if you look at the white paper, I do have a link uh, of a very good explanation that actually proves it with equations and such. If you are so inclined, uh, but the point is, if you get like a lot of dimensions, I'm talking like hundreds of thousands of the different dimensions that you're working with. Uh, kind of all the distances look the same. And it's, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine because, I don't know, I, I assume that the policy is that there's no uh, mind-altering drugs in, in Black Hat. But uh, the point is, all, all the distances in this higher dimensional space, they actually end up being pretty much the same on average. It's very hard to tell things apart. Everything looks kind of the same because the space is so big like, and the, uh, that everything is so far away from each other, you have actually doesn't really matter anymore uh, if you're trying to measure stuff like that, right? And a way of understanding that is that uh, if you actually uh, try to calculate what's the volume of a sphere in this space, in this multi-evil, uh, dimensional space uh, against uh, what the cube looks like, right? You will see that the, the volume of the sphere goes to zero very, very quickly, right? And uh, everything seems too far away, and you can't really measure like a unit distance uh, very, uh, very easily. So uh, I'm going to try to show a practical example, right? So let's say you have a bunch of cats and dogs in a, a multi-dimensional space, like, and you're trying to draw distances between cats and dogs, right? And uh, anyway, as you go up the dimensions and you see that evil uh, uh, multi-dimensional multi, uh, cube there, I think it's, uh, it's supposed to represent like eight dimensions. You see all the cats and dogs are very lonely and they are very far away from the center and they can't really talk to each other. But anyway, let's try a more practical example. Uh, what if I'm trying to do some net flow analysis with an, a company that has about N nodes, right? And what I'm trying to measure is how how is there change uh, on the, the ways that the machines are talking, or these nodes are talking to each other on the network, right? Let's say that I, so I'll have like two to the, uh, two times n to the power of two minus n 
possible connections between those machines, right? And then I will be uh, actually considering all the ports and considering, of course, choosing a port for each one of them, uh, and uh, of course, the direction of the of the communication. So. With a thousand nodes, which is a very, very tiny uh, corporation, I'd say, it's half a trillion possible dimensions there. And uh, of course, it's a very sparse matrix, and not everyone talks to everyone, and all those things, but uh, you can't just think that you're going to throw uh, anomaly detection on a higher dimensional uh, problem, and the, 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 it's just going to figure itself out, right? You, you really have to uh, do some th different things. And this has been a subject of research for many, 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 many years, right? Uh, uh, to actually break this curse, right? So there are some ideas that, that, that there are some, there are actually some uh, companies I've seen who actually come forward with a very uh, uh, solution, uh, problem solving orientation around this. Uh, where they have different metrics, or they're doing something on a sub-manifold or something like that. The, the manifold is a scary word, but just think about, you have this, you have the, it's, it's just like the Earth. The Earth is round, like it's a sphere, but for us, where we are locally, it seems like it's flat. It, 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 we can draw an Euclidean uh, thing here, although it wouldn't be an Euclid, Euclidean space if we were only on 2D. That, that's pretty much what you have to think. If you're so inclined, think about warp drives, Star Trek, that's also a good analogy, but uh, I'll stick with the Earth for now. And um, there's a lot of different techniques, right? And uh, my point is, and there are a few interesting results. And I say interesting as in, I cannot understand the abstract of what's written on the paper. It's way, way over my head. But um, the point that I'm trying to make here is that this is an open problem. Uh, in machine learning in mathematics. It's someone who claims to have solved this, I mean, might as well be a trillionaire in ad networks because, uh, I mean, all the smart people in, in machine learning are actually making money in ad networks. But, uh, or they could be literally curing cancer with this kind of things, right? Uh, there's actually, uh, there's a, what's the, it's called Project Baseline that Google just launched, launched recently, where they're actually going to try to data mine uh, the genome for a bunch of people, and they're going to see if we can find some anomalies there that maybe can point to some clues of what we should be looking at. So uh, a funny story is that actually I was using this curing cancer example, and there was someone who actually reached out to me and told me that, oh, you should see the medical applications of our research. And I said, well, that, sh that sounds like awesome. Right? I just don't want to be sick wherever you, you are, uh, your, that company is working. But the point is, this is a complicated subject. Look into it. I mean, if you're really inclined and someone is, I'm doing anomaly detection and I've broken the curse of dimensionality, you should check twice, right? This is a very, very bold claim. And some people may have, uh, get some limited results that actually make some of these things feasible, right? I just don't want you to fall prey to this guy, right? It's like there's this weird trick that I'm doing that makes everything solvable. Just, just be careful, right? Just make sure that um, uh, people are not trying to constantly blind you uh, with math. Oh, I, I really like the, the one with the helmet. It's awesome. Anyway, but that's just one problem, right? Uh, I want to talk about normality poisoning attacks. And uh, this is actually, I have seen more than one people discuss this when they were talking about uh, big data analytics and things like that. And, uh, and again, I go back to the, st the story about normality, right? So uh, what is normal, right? What is my ground truth, right? What am I trying to prove that's bad? What am I trying to prove that's good? And um, if, you don't, if you don't have a good, good grasp of that, right? And I, this is gonna sound like every single uh, person who ever a challenged uh, an anomaly detection product. I mean, I said I probably said that sentence in like 2004 when I was, uh, I don't know, doing uh, IPS integration. But I'd say, yeah, but what if your uh, malicious traffic is hiding inside your normal traffic, right? And it sounds like it's just nitpicking, uh, but the fact is. Uh, in anomaly detection in general, in, in specifically in, in our field, uh, the number of, the, the, the kind of stuff that looks like normal, 
uh, is actually, uh, there's a lot more normal than anomalies, right? There's, there's a, I mean, of course, uh, let's hope that's not, the, uh, that, that is the case for your company, but there's infinite more uh, machines inside your network that are not infected by malware than th there are. Or at least that should be the norm, right? The fact is nobody really knows, and you're just having this thing there, and uh, I really believe that uh, um, oh, if these things actually catch on and people start using more anomaly detection, we will see a lot of uh, adversarial work around this and that people will actively try to break this and actually really try to, to uh, make their traffic look more like what's normal, right? I have this example, I don't know if you guys know Waze, it's, uh, it was bought by Google recently. Uh, so it's actually, it's kind of a crowdsource thing where it, it gets input from users in order to tell you if the traffic is going uh, well in, while you're driving or not. Uh, the point is, I mean, I have a few friends that they're like, okay, I'm about to leave work, so I'm gonna put like a lot, lot of accidents around my, my building so that the, the traffic clears and then I can leave and go away, right? Okay, this is silly, but this is the kind of stuff that, I, that I'm talking about, right? You, you, have, you have no way of figuring that out. You have no way of filtering that. And finally, my favorite, Hanlon's razor, right? And again, this is, the, this is one of the problems of uh, you not exactly knowing what you're looking for. And uh, it sounds funny, but this is actually a huge cause of people trying to use uh, anomaly detection-like products and then just shutting the hell damn thing off because there's like too much stuff going on, too many alerts, too many things. And when they actually, most of them should potentially be handled by the operations team, the DevOps team, like I was talking before. And then if something, okay, this is really weird. I mean, we do not understand as the people who own this system. Maybe we should involve the, the actual security team. But that's hard, right? It's much, it's much harder to desi design a process like that and try to advise people a process like that than actually just selling a box or something like that. I mean, if I, want you, I just want you to think of this, right, while you are, you are evaluating this kind of things. Who is most likely to have done something bad? Is it the evil hacker or is it the hipster hacker, right? The guy who is coding Node.js, you know, and wanted to get closer to the metal on your production stuff. And uh, yeah, the guy just broke your stuff. I mean, you just, just pushed the wrong commit. And I really thank Matt for taking the picture. I owe him a beverage of his choice. Anyway, what about user behavior? Uh, it kind of works. It's, it's actually awesome. But it works for specific implementations of specific solutions, right? When you're talking about user behavior anomaly, user behavior anomaly detection, you're talking about fraud detection, product fraud detection. You have something that you know very well how, how it works, has a very limited scope, someone has actually gone through the trouble of documenting the whole thing, right? And they can actually analyze and create uh, 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 what should be the, the ideal features, what should be the ideal way that this kinds of thing should work. So there's, there's some good examples from, from Square, from Airbnb recently, where, where they were describing how they were uh, uh, getting feedback from the systems and, uh, and pushing it forward to, to create a machine learning model. Granted, it was classification, it was supervised model, but um, it was it's very interesting. Uh, the question that I have, and this is an open question for me as well, right? Can it be general enough? Can we create like a general user behavioral analogy? And uh, I've seen stuff like file exfiltration, right? But it all sounds like, um, I mean, okay, we will do machine learning to prevent your files from being exfiltered, but you have to make sure that you have clearly documented and implemented all the roles and that you have a very clear information classification policy in your company and you feed that to the system. If I have that, I do not need machine learning. And, uh, I mean, it doesn't, uh, to be fair, like, most of the guys who, most of the, 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 the companies that are, uh, around, have some sort of, of, of information like this, they will usually be from people that were from the intelligence community. They were from, the government. Well, that's all a given. That's awesome, right? It probably works there very well because they will have very definite roles, they will have very definite information classification, but that's not how the enterprise world works. And probably never will. 
So anyway, also just a side note, has nothing to do with this talk, right? If you are like X and SA or something like that, don't, set, don't tell them that you have like something to prevent your files from being stolen, right? It doesn't look good, right? It's not, not the best branding that you can go for. But anyway, um, if it's not files, then if it's systems, right? Can I average out user behavior? So it's like, uh, oh, from different systems, I have some different profiles that somehow I was able to automatically extract the way that these applications work to create some sort of fraud detection profile. Can I just average them out? I mean, if I'm like, I don't know, going crazy on the expense report, right, because I just came to, I went to Vegas and like had way too many drinks, is this gonna count badly on my user behavior so then when I go to the work file, it's gonna trigger me? How does that work? How, how do you talk about user behavior in general? I don't know that, I don't have enough information, but you should be asking people that. If people are selling you user behavior, you should, okay, what does that mean? How does that work? Anyway, um, anyway it's, it's like getting very late. Uh, anyway, I just wanna talk about classification real quickly, and this is an old slide. Uh, the point about classification is that I actually know what I'm trying to classify. So I'm aware that I'm trying to tell dogs and cats apart. And uh, I might have a bunch of samples of cats, or maybe just that one, and I ha might have a bunch of samples of dogs, or maybe just that one, right? And uh, again, I'm talking about the ground truth stuff, right? Because if you don't have enough ground truth, or you cannot express whatever the dogs and cats are, right? I mean, you're gonna miss some, miss some easy stuff, like this happy cat, right? There are no happy cats. I have all the cats in my data set, and they're all grumpy. No, there are happy cats. You are just like ignoring them, right? The same way, not all dogs are as majestic, as thoughtful as Doge, right? You get stuff like this. So, it's challenging. You, you gotta constantly be, be asking yourselves if, if whatever you're doing to train is actually re representative of the ground truth that you have. But anyway, I'm much more, uh, I like classification much more, right? And there's been a lot of malware active, actually activity researching malware, and I put that there on purpose. Uh, and um, classification, clustering of malware samples, and it's all very exciting because there actually has been a lot of data sets that have been published, and people have been uh, trying to, to make this happen and try to, and I, honestly, uh, from what I've seen, uh, stuff that try to, cl to actually cluster malware, what I'm trying to say is that I already know that this is a malware, I wanna know what kind it is, what kind of lineage it's coming from, where, does the code, where did the code base uh, evolve from. These have been much more promising, these have been uh, actually getting interesting results, than actually, okay, I'm detecting malware here. And the reason why I say that is that my guess is that if someone is kicking ass on this and is actually doing the, 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 the work, it's AV companies. They've had all these data set for ages and they have been, had uh, big data uh, actual uh, stuff to, uh, to, to use them and to analyze them for ages, right? So, I mean, we're bashing them. They're probably on the, they're probably on the, the front end the, of this. So, but what concerns me, because I never turn on the heuristics on the AV because it's crap. It always crashes my machine. I mean, can we do better than AV and heuristics, right? And again, this is an open question. This is something that people should be trying to, if, if you're approached by someone like this, okay, how are you, are you better than this, right? Because there is a lot of data, but there's a lot of research that's crappy. There's a lot of research where you're putting uh, evil malware stuff against, I don't know, calc.xe, right? And that's gonna be a great, I mean, it's gonna get a great, like, low false positive rate or anything like that, if that's what you're comparing it against, right? So, again, you gotta be mindful of the ground troops. You gotta be mindful where, how are these people training this model? How are these people doing this? I mean, if I had something, right, that could potentially download and run code from the internet, right, access the file system, access the camera, uh, access location information, send it to remote servers, right, what would potentially I try to compare it to, right? I mean, it's like we got a bunch of these. And, uh, but hey, I just had an idea. Maybe the difference between the average browser and a malware is actually that browsers have sandboxes. Oh, damn you Firefox, we almost had it. Uh, sorry guys, this is not the time that we, we have solved this. But uh, it looks like I'm being very critical, but the point is that everyone makes mistakes, right? There was this guy last year, <laughs> he was talking about this model that he built, and he was like, hey, I used Alexa. 
uh, for, my, for my good stuff, for the, the things that are not malicious. And that's lame, because Alexa is a very bad measure of this. I mean, honestly, we do have, there are very, if you're doing work with uh, uh, IP addresses and domain names, there are very few uh, interesting measures or, or sources for uh, goodness, right? There are some people who are helping out of that. Uh, OpenDNS uh, recently released, um, uh, they're calling the random, random domains data feed, where they actually have their own version of Alexa, like 10,000 uh, top or something. And they just get like, okay, these are 10,000 guys that we think that are not malicious. Some of them might be, like, but then have you guys ever looked at Alexa? Uh, but that's interesting. I mean, if you guys, if, if some of you like, are interested in this and want to try this out, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good resource for, for you to look at. But anyway, um, how's it going then, right? Because that guy obviously had no idea uh, uh, what, was, what he was talking about. And um, what I have been trying to do, right, and this is, and this is for a thousand failed experiments, this seems to be one that is actually looking uh, promising, right, is a private beta of our uh, models that are based out of threat intelligence. And uh, the actual ground truth is coming from stuff that I know that has been painstakingly researched from other people, but there's not enough of these people. And uh, potentially we can use the markers and we can use the information that they have researched in order to expand our knowledge, right? The same way that if you are like a huge corporation, if you are an MSSP or something like that, uh, and you get these feeds and you actually, you don't like use them as block lists. I mean, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. I have actually another talk that I talk uh, uh, a lot more about uh, threat intelligence. But ideally you should have a team who is analyzing this and learning from this, this stuff and, 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 and doing these patterns, right? And this is pretty much what I'm trying to build, uh, which is a model that will be able to learn in the same way as an analyst would learn and uh, search for the same information that an analyst searches, right, when they're, they're doing their investigation to uh, see what's bad, see what's good. Yeah. But anyway, why should you care, right? Uh, the point is, it's kind of effective for triage. Right? If you've got a bunch of log files that you're not looking, you're not doing anything at all, um, it's, a, it's a great first triage to get like a list of 20, 10 things that you should investigate on the following day as, as, as a part of the, of the, of the routine of the, of the security people there. Right? Just send some logs, right? and don't worry, it's only metadata. Right? We're not interested in, in the actual content for now. Uh, and you get a, <laughs> and you, you receive a report with a list of, of, of uh, potential compromised machines. I mean, you might want to download the feeds and do it yourself, of course. I mean, we have some open source tools, that, some tools that we open sourced yesterday on the other talk I was doing, uh, where you can uh, uh, easily, easily, <laughs> it's a Python program, uh, 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 harvest these feeds from the internet, create some lists for them that you could, you could potentially export to several different things. Only CSV and the stuff that we actually needed for the, the presentation is ready now, but we are, we're committed to working on it. And there's actually a, a, the, the TIQ test, which is trying to uh, do a statistical analysis on the threat intelligence feeds and see how do they compare against each other. And uh, is this new feed that I bought actually bringing me value or not? You could do all of that, or you could just have someone who's doing, who's trying at least to do the work for you. But anyway, what about the ground truth, right? I've been talking so much about the ground truth. Uh, what are you doing, Alex? What's, what's this ground truth look like? Uh, well, there are a huge amount of, of uh, threat intelligence feeds now, both open and commercial, right? And uh, we've been painstakingly trying to figure out which ones are the best fit for what we're trying to do. And some of that is, is distilled on the, the tools that I told you. And, uh, but no malicious samples are still very challenging, right? And uh, we tried different things, like very high-hanged Alexa, Quanticast, the OpenDNS stuff. Uh, but we actually devised some techniques where we can infer uh, what an actual customer finds to be good or not, finds to be non-malicious or not. Basically. Uh, and then, uh, oh, now I'm going a little bit on the, anomalous, on the anomaly detection side of things, but I'm actually just using it to seed uh, something and making this model not so much entirely supervised, but a little bit semi-supervised. I don't really know what these things are, but I have a high inkling that these are, these are positive. And that actually helps with the bias a lot. So if you have a company that's not 
your average US company that goes to the sites that are on an Exa and Quanticast, um, you see that their popular sites are very, very different. And uh, it helps even out these unknowns when you're hunting for uh, false positives. Um, anyway, but what about the data tampering thing that you were talking about, Alex? Well, most of the features that we use are actually derived from uh, stru structural data and intrinsic data from the internet. Stuff like GYP, the ASN, where it's coming from, a lot of passive DNS information that we use, uh, Farsight's uh, DNSDB, uh, in order to harvest this. They, they are by far the most complete uh, source that we came, uh, we came across, right? And, but the point is, of course the attacker can tamper with the logs, and if no one sees the logs, no one is gonna, gonna detect that the attacker did something, but he cannot tamper with those other things without cost. He cannot keep changing the IP addresses all the time, right? They will have a structure that they set up, and they are, they're trying to milk it, uh, and try not to be detected for as, as, as long as they can before they actually have to invest their time, money, or whatever e evil resources that they have uh, to move to the, to the next thing. So it helps out pretty well. I think that uh, uh, potentially, uh, the, I mean, there is, there is a path to try to find malicious stuff by anomaly detection, but it has to be grounded some, in somewhere that cannot be easily tampered with, uh, with anything else. But what about the false positives, right? You were talking so much about false positives and stuff like that. And uh, it's a fact of life, right? You're never gonna get everything right, and you might as well just accept that. And, uh, and uh, if anyone, again, it's like the 100% security thing. You just like walk away if someone starts uh, talking about that. Uh, but uh, the feedback that we got is that they were good false positives, whatever that means, right? I would be, I, I don't like false positives at all, but yeah, it could have fooled us. It could have fooled, I mean, people had extensive trouble in actually trying to disprove that this thing was bad, but we figured out it was a misconfiguration on a link online thing on somewhere else which it was actually pointing such and such. And uh, the cool thing is that this feedback, and this, it's actually improving the model over time for everyone who's potentially using it. Because, of course, there's stuff that we get ridiculously wrong, right? Because everybody does. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a learning process, uh, literally. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, it helps us uncover what are the different features and what are the different things that we should be looking at and adding to the potential models so that they can get stronger, right? And remember, uh, I'm proposing this as triage, right? No one's, it's not gonna tell you like, it's Captain Mustard and with the candlestick and the library, but it's gonna tell you, man, you should head to the library right now. Some, some shit is gonna about to happen right there. So it should be enough. I mean, when you're talking about the, the amount of, of information that has to be sifted, right? It should be enough to help focus people, right? And help them do uh, a better job. So anyway, I propose a buyer's guide, right? So if people are actually trying to push you something, if people are actually trying to tell you about how awesome this machine learning thing is, right, you should ask them a few questions, right? And I mean, for, peop for, for the ones who have been paying attention, these were exactly the, the questions that I just, just answered. Uh, but um, you should try to get a better understanding and, 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 and get a grasp of, uh, what is the ground truth? What, what, what should be important? Should, this, modern, should this, this model ever work? Does it make sense what people are doing, right? Before we are, um, anyone is to move forward. I just don't want people to waste their time. I hate uh, uh, asymmetric information, especially in sales. And I think that if we're not able to choose the tools that, I mean, we're voting with our money, right? That whole shebang. If we're not able to choose the tools that are actually doing the most valuable research, we're gonna pretty much uh, stay where we are forever, right? And uh, I don't want that. I don't want to pilot sims anymore, God forbid. Help me out, guys. Um, uh, but anyway, I, I, pro I also propose a game, right? If you go, if a vendor comes to you and tells you a bunch of stuff about machine learning and you ask them the questions, right? And uh, they say, no, 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 I do anomaly detection, but I'm different. I'm not uh, like all those guys you've met before. Right? I am very different. I'm not exactly the kind of person that you think I am. I propose a new hashtag called not all algorithms. Right? So just hashtag them. And please, don't hashtag me. Right? Of course you can. Just do whatever you want. 
if you, if you don't agree with what I've said. But um, the point is, let's try to understand. Uh, and let's ask the hard questions. Let's understand uh, what these questions are and uh, how we can better make, uh, we can better use machine learning and we can better evolve as an industry and hopefully actually get some vacation, right? Like the joke in the beginning. I don't, sound like, I don't need to lose your jobs, but maybe, I don't know, only working five times a week should be good, right? Anyway, just wrapping up. Don't take my word for it, right? If you guys want to uh, sign up, help us test, uh, send me an email, whatever, this, it's, it should be relatively easy to find me, right? We are, um, it's not just if you want to get a report, if you're interested in some sort of data sharing agreement with the, the threat intelligence stuff, we are all for that as well. Um, anyway, just uh, the small plug. And uh, limited capacity, guys, so I'll get to all of you, but, uh, and uh, let's move this. Anyway, that's pretty much all I had. Thank you so much. How much do we have time? Anyone want to ask a question? Yes. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm not sure if I heard the question right. Uh, can you? Uh, Oh yeah, okay, how marketability drives the learning techniques. Uh, uh, the problem, you, the thing, uh, so the question is, should I use a neural network because the name is more trendy, is that it? Is that what you're asking? Okay. Uh, to, to be honest, I haven't quite come across that as blatantly. Right? But I would not be surprised uh, if we have uh, uh, companies that they come forward saying that they're using deep learning, right, to do, so yeah, we're using deep learning neural networks now because it's the new hotness in machine learning. And uh, deep learning is, is something that's specifically dangerous because uh, nobody really understands how they work, although people sound like they do. And there's actually a lot of research where uh, you're actually doing this, uh, all this sort of uh, image parsing that they do with uh, deep learning right now? Huh? Yes, the blind spots, exactly. So people don't really, they think that they're actually decomposing the, 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 the frame. Oh, this is a house. But actually, no, it's some weird points. You can just edit the image, uh, which is visually the same, right? But then the, the model is completely lost. So if we have, and again, images are complicated, right? Uh, but if we don't have a good grasp, a good intuition how the model works, <laughs> what's going to come out of it, right? I mean, I, uh, for my stuff, I just, I run a bunch of them. I have a bunch of different algorithms for each day, and whoever wins, wins. Okay, this was the one that had the best performance. That's, you're, you're, you're king for the day, right? Let's see what tomorrow brings. And I think that's the way, the algorithm, it's just like, uh, at least in my perspective, it's just like crypto. All the primitives are there. Everyone knows the primitive. It's like, uh, you, you can't, oh my God, nobody must know that I'm using AES. No, it's all about the engineering that you put around it. Are you salting, are you hashing, what are you doing first? How are you, how are you actually building it out? Any more? Yes, sorry, he, he was there first. I, um, I, I have work where I have sanitized some things. So we actually have, uh, I mean, it's not, it's, it, it's one of our internal tools which actually helps uh, sanitize and anonymize a bunch of stuff. It pretty much gets whatever you tell them, whatever you tell it, it's um, uh, sensitive. And it uh, age max it and encrypts it with a key that you only you have. So I can give you back, okay, this is the age mac. Uh, that I got as a result, and then you go back and you, you reverse it. The, the problem is, um, the actual, so the internal IP addresses, I don't, I, don't, I don't care, 
right? As long as I can tell them apart, that's awesome. But of course I need the external IP address, otherwise there's absolutely nothing that I can do. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I didn't understand. I'm sorry, we don't care about the internal address, we don't care about the external Yeah, yeah, so yeah, the work. Uh, it, yeah. yeah, and I've come across this uh, before. Actually, I've have heard, I heard organizations that were, were like that, and uh, I'm afraid there's, there's not a lot that I can do about that. No, it doesn't work like that. Um, I'm specifically trying to not crowd people with information. I mean, it wouldn't make sense. It would, uh, although I do, I do want to create some sort of API so that you can, okay, let me check this internally here to see, to see what, what would come out. But the, the model really shines when it actually has your data to do some, some comparisons against the, the actual proportions that it has inside it. And, um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's not like I'm providing you a feed with 100,000 different IP addresses that then you have to figure out for yourself how you're gonna match this thing eternally. I'm actually just telling you, okay, of your logs, these are the guys that you should investigate. And that's pretty much the, that's the actual spirit of the thing. So we can talk more. I mean, happy to, to take a card, but it sounds, sounds hard. No problem, please. Thank you. What I? Oh, the, uh, you mean? Uh, I don't know. There's there's a bunch of them. I mean. Uh, um. I don't. I don't think I'd be able to name one for you. I mean, I can. I can. I can chat. We can try to chat offline, and maybe I can. I can run some names by you to see if the, it's the same people that you know. But I would be hard pressed to try to endorse any of them, uh, uh, or anyone. I, I specifically avoid saying any names of any companies here, although I made fun, made fun of a bunch of them. So it's <laughs> anyway. That's 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 one of the perks of the job. But thank you. Um, anyone else? Yeah, this one there. Um, anything that you can identify IP addresses or domain names. So think about uh, outbound firewall logs. Think about web proxy logs. IDS logs, yes, but uh, IDS logs makes more, make more sense for internal inbound stuff. We ha I mean, the model works both for, uh, for outbound threats and inbound threats, right? But uh, we see most mileage out of uh, the outbound stuff. But anyway, it's, uh, so stuff like firewall, IDSs, uh, web proxy logs. Web proxy logs are specifically interesting because they, you can see what was the IP address that the guy visited and also what was the domain name that he accessed. So that gives it, I can actually have multiple models competing to see which one will, will win. DNS is also very interesting. There's different stuff that we can get from DNS as well. There's, there's a lot of research in DNS. I have a bunch of friends in OpenDNS as well and uh, the, they, they do some, some cool work about around that as well. Huh? Why do you get value because it's more actionable. So people can, they can, first, threat intelligence is more precise on the outbound thing. Because when you think about inbound, people were just publishing like bazillion IP addresses that someday hit some honeypot, right? And uh, the odd chance that some, one of that guy attacks you, it's probably going to be exploiting a Joomla uh, uh, vulnerability on your IIS server. So. It's, it's, it's all about, I mean, if you have to pick your fights, if, you have to, uh, if, you're, if you're running a SOC or something like that, I would rather focus on the outbound stuff than on the inbound stuff. But both models, I mean, they're pretty much the same at heart, so they, they would work similarly. Am I being kicked out? Uh, guys, sorry, I'm getting kicked out. What you're gonna say, you said you were going to do something to me. What was that? You're going to shame me because if I went past, yeah? Okay, I do not want to be shamed. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>